The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 11 The boy stared, appalled, unable to believe what he'd just done. Aaron and Pepper had cried out, begging him to stop, but they were too late to keep his finger from squeezing the trigger. And now they, too, looked on in mute horror at the murder scene that had just played out before them. Sheriff Hoyt, on the other hand, was as happy as a fag in the boys' locker room. When Morgan had finally cracked and fired the gun, there'd been no gunshot, no bullet wound, and no blood, only a faint click. The gun was not loaded. A tear ran down Morgan's cheek as the sheriff took the useless revolver out of the boy's hand. Yep, smirked Hoyt. This one's the killer, all right. Only this time, he looked at Morgan. You shot yourself a sheriff. Then he reached over the front seat of the van and took the car keys from the ignition where Aaron had left them. None of these kids were going anywhere until he'd completed his investigation. A voice called to him, told him to wake up and to get out of there. He shook his head and groaned, but the voice persisted. It was now or never. He had to do something. He had to break free. The words were barely audible through the wave of pain that washed over him, and the meaning was dulled by the unique tiredness of blood loss. But Andy knew that the words were his own. They were a soundless, rallying cry for survival, stirring from deep within his soul. Only there was no use in listening. What would be the point? He was hanging from a meat hook in the underground basement of a psychopath. He was his prisoner. He was going nowhere. Unless Aaron had got away, unless she came to rescue him, death was inevitable. He was dying. And even if he could get down from the meat hook, how could he get out of the house? How could he escape on one pathetic leg? And there was no way he could beat the second-skinned bastard in a fight. Face it, he was finished. Yet still, the voice urged him to try. It wasn't about hope anymore. Andy was beyond hope. It was about the fish wriggling on the hook, the wounded deer limping away to avoid the headshot, the armadillo dragging its crushed legs off the highway rather than surrender and become roadkill. It was about gaining one more second of life. Andy moaned. The pain was so bad. So bad. There was a large pipe running horizontally behind his shoulders. As best he could, he rested his upper back on it. His remaining foot dangled only a yard up off the ground. There was something beneath him, furniture of some kind, but Andy was too tired to see what it was. All he cared about was that he could see his own blood dropping down onto the wood and then rolling down to form a puddle on the wet floor. Again, that damned voice was telling him to do something quick while the damned face freak with the chainsaw was out of the room. His attacker had left the basement some time ago. It could have been minutes, it could have been hours. Andy had expected to receive a killing blow at any moment, but he'd simply been left to hang, to die slowly and painfully on the meat hook. For one darkly humorous moment, Andy recalled how he'd gone with Aaron up to the house. He thought he was safe because he was young, strong, and carrying that tire iron. But that bastard had taken him out with pathetic ease. 
He'd come after him, sliced his fucking leg off, and then assumed complete control of him. And now Andy had been left hanging, hanging there from a meat hook beneath contempt, not even worth execution, left helplessly to die. No, he couldn't accept it. He couldn't go down like this, not like this. Maybe fighting, running, anything. But he couldn't just hang there and bleed to death like a total loser. He had to do something. He had to make that bastard pay. Andy looked up and groaned. As he lifted his head, his neck muscles contracted and expanded, pulling on his chest muscles, abdomen, his whole dismembered and impelled body, causing agony to explode through the damage of his terrible wounds. But now he could see. The hook was at the end of a stout chain that came down from a sturdy crossbeam, a few feet above his head. Maybe there was something he could do after all. He took a few moments to marshal all the strength in his broad, powerful arms, at the same time preparing himself for the overwhelming rush of broken pain that would soon be tearing into his very soul. One deep breath. His face was pale, ashen gray. A second deep breath. He clenched his jaws and snarled, wincing as he raised both hands to take hold of the iron chain above and behind his head. The basement echoed with his piteous moans, but he'd done it. He'd grabbed the chain and was now locked in position, ready. Fist by agonizing fist, he began to pull himself up the chain. The links rattled, each one being no more than an inch in length, yet each seeming an impossible distance as the boy took the pain and used his muscular arms to haul himself up. All he needed was to get enough slack in the chain. Then, if he could find somewhere to brace his foot... Oh, he was slipping. Exertion had taken its toll, not in fatigue, but in sweat. His palms had become slick with salt water, and suddenly his hands were finding it tough to grip anything. He had dropped only about an inch, but the sudden motion of the chain pulled on the hook embedded in the soft flesh of his back. He moaned, but was able to check his fall, keeping some slack in the chain. Sweat was now stinging his eyes, and his breathing was coarse and labored, but at least he hadn't dropped all the way back down again. He paused, readying himself for a second attempt. It wasn't looking too good. He needed all his strength just to hang on. Again, a cry escaped his lips, and again the chain rattled as he reached up over his head and began to... That's when he lost his grip. Fearing the worst, Andy tried everything he could to slow the fall. His hands clawed and grabbed at the straightening chain, but it was no use. His body dropped, the chain pulled tight, and the meat hook tore his insides apart, breaking the bones of his spine, and the total loser screamed his empty heart out. The police car was moving at a leisurely pace back down the access road towards town. It was fully dark now and the silver light of the moon seemed to strobe through the silhouetted woodland of dead, contorted trees. Morgan had been arrested. The sheriff had charged the boy with the murder of the teenage girl while under the influence of illegal substances. Then he had handcuffed and bundled him into the back of the patrol car. Sure, the girls had complained a whole lot, but as far as the sheriff was concerned, they were suspects too. He told them straight out that he thought they were all a bunch of drug-taking hippie shits. He believed the girls when they said they had two more friends skulking about the place, but he didn't believe any of their bullcrap about the Hewitt house. If there was any trouble up at the farm, it was probably being caused by those two missing boys being high on acid. And that's why he confiscated the car keys. He didn't want them to go anywhere until he'd had time to put Morgan behind bars. Then he'd come back, ask them some more questions, and then go look for the other two boys, if they actually existed. Aaron had argued with him. She couldn't understand why she and Pepper couldn't drive down to the station with him, or why the sheriff couldn't finish his questions and then take Morgan. Why keep going back and forth like that? None of it made sense. 
but every time she'd started to get a bit lippy, he'd threaten to run her in with the boy. As far as Hoyt was concerned, his little charade with the revolver had 100% proved the greasy-haired punk's guilt. Morgan stared at the handcuffs holding his wrists together. There was a sense of unreality about the whole situation, something he'd felt many times during the day. If only they'd just dumped the body at the mill and left. If only they never picked the teenager up in the first place. If only they'd stayed on the interstate to Dallas. If only, if only, if fucking only. Sooner or later, they'd have to bring him a lawyer, and when they did, Morgan would make sure that Sheriff Christ Almighty Hoyt would end up in deep shit. What that pig had done back up at the van was tantamount to torture. That bastard had terrified Morgan half to death. Morgan was still scared now, but was nowhere close to the pitch of fear he felt when the sheriff had forced him to put the gun inside of his own goddamn mouth. Man, he called from the back seat. This bullshit. I got rights. Hoyt looked back through the rear view. The boy was just letting off steam. The cop grinned, scrawny little hill shit. They drove in silence for a moment, the car rocking side to side. Then finally, "'Where were you guys headed?' asked the sheriff. Morgan sighed, looked at his cuffs. "'Dallas, Skinner concert.' "'I like Skinner,' purred the sheriff. "'Me too.' Morgan wondered whether this was just the sheriff's idea of polite conversation or whether he was angling for something. The sheriff glanced at the rearview mirror another time, studying the boy. Guess we got something in common, huh? He drawled sarcastically. Then after another moment's silence. What are you gonna do with your tickets, boy? Morgan looked up. His eyes met the sheriff in the rear view. Was the sheriff saying what he thought he was saying? You want him? He asked hopefully. You can have him, man. No reply. And they covered another short stretch of road in uneasy silence. A bottle of bourbon lay in the passenger seat next to the sheriff's ass. Most of the liquor was already gone, and now Hoyt lifted the booze to his mouth and finished it off, one hand on the steering wheel, the other round the neck of the bottle. He smacked his lips and sighed. Good stuff. Then he held the empty bottle up and took a quick look at it, all gone. That's a bribe? he asked slyly. The tickets... A bribe? Morgan was unsure how to answer. The sheriff swung his arm round and smashed the thick, heavy bottle into Morgan's mouth. Blood exploded across the bottom of the young man's face. He howled in pain, his teeth cracking and breaking loose, one of them slipping back down his throat and being swallowed in an instant. The bottle had shattered, showering glass all over the back seat and the floor. Almost immediately, shock numbed the pain. Morgan reached a hand to his mouth and found that his lips were bound with viscous strands of thick blood. He opened up and gently prodded, tearfully finding that the middle four teeth of his top jaw had all been smashed to bits. Oh, I'm sorry, said Hoyt mockingly. That was rude. Did you want some? Morgan sobbed with pain, trying his best to hold it together. When he talked to his lawyer, the sheriff sneered and threw the broken bottle down on the floor where it came to rest beside a heavy torque wrench wrapped in duct tape. He looked back at the boy and snickered. The kid was in a real state. Yes, sir, a real state. Now we've got even more in common, he chuckled. Morgan shook his head, trying to think straight. Got what in common? Skinnered? More? What? What? He looked up and saw the sheriff's face. Hoyt had removed a clip of false teeth from the front of his mouth and was smiling with gap-toothed malice into the rear view. The officer roared with laughter, then hit the gas hard, pushing Morgan back into his seat, where he lay handcuffed amidst the shards of broken bottle, blood spit and cracked teeth. Oh God, I don't want to die.
The abandoned Crawford Mill looked even worse at night. The shadows, which before had been held at bay by the sun, now crept out through the open doors and windows. Aaron had now explained everything to Pepper about Andy, about old Monty and the house, and about that thing with the... Aaron didn't want to think about it. She told Pepper they hadn't found Kemper, but that she was pretty sure he was up there somewhere. It was clear the two girls couldn't do anything about it. If they went back up to the Hewitt place, they'd both be killed. And it was just as clear that Sheriff Hoyt was a twisted, sadistic fuck. Which meant only one thing. They were on their own. Now they had breathing space to think things through. A whole lot more pieces of the jigsaw fell into place. That teenage girl, the one they'd picked up, she was half mad with fear because she'd escaped these bastards. She'd come from California with her family and had somehow taken a wrong turn that ended up at the Hewitt house. The girl had said, They're all dead. That's exactly what she'd said. She must have meant that her family had all been murdered, which meant that Kemper and Andy would also be murdered if they hadn't been already. Hell, the signs had been all over the place, but they just didn't know how to read them. The hidden clearing with the wrecked cars, the auto spares, the luggage and clothes for sale down at Luda Maze, all taken from people passing through. Christ, some of the clothes and automobiles they saw were almost 20 years old, and no one knew anything about it? How could a series of murders like this go unnoticed for so long? And what about Luda Maze yard sale? She was the one who'd sent them up here to the mill in the first place. So either Luda May was in on it, or she didn't care too much where her merchandise came from. But something still didn't quite add up. Luda May had sent them here to meet the sheriff, and Hoyt did eventually come out and meet them at the mill. Things went wrong only when Aaron and Kemper went to the Hewitt house, thinking it was the sheriff's place. And they'd gone there on the advice of Jedediah. It was the small boy who'd sent them into real danger. So, was he part of it? The crazy kid sure as hell seemed happy to spend most of his time up here at the mill, and he had a thing about the dead girl, which meant the mill was probably involved as well. But then, it had to be. It was near the auto graveyard in the Hewitt place, and just look at all the revolting skulls and shit. Suddenly, they realized that they'd been sent up here, like so many others before them to become sitting ducks, which was all Aaron and Pepper needed to figure to decide to get the fuck out of there. There was no argument, no discussion, no vote. They just needed to get the van started and make a break for it, and then they'd go straight to the state police or the FBI, and not some redneck creep with his sadistic evil mind games. Only problem was, Hoyt had taken the keys to the van. Not that this would stop Aaron. Pepper held the flashlight steady while Aaron found a Swiss Army knife she kept tucked in her knapsack at the rear of the van. Then Aaron went and set up front and Pepper took a position close behind the driver's seat so that she could point the beam down over Aaron's shoulder. There, she watched as Aaron set to work on the ignition switch with her knife. What do you think he's going to do to Morgan? Asked Pepper innocently. Gay rape, beat up, and torture sprang to mind, but Aaron was busy working on the lock, trying to pry the damn thing open. But it was tough. I don't want to- The blade snapped. Shit! Aaron quickly slid a second blade out of its compartment in the knife and bent forward for another try. She pushed the edge of the knife into the exact same position, hoping that the cover may have at least been loosened a little by her previous attempt. The sooner they got out of here, the sooner they could get the cops to turn a spotlight on this whole rat bastard dump. And if there is a god, he'd make sure the Hewitts were sent to the chair and he'd fry the fuckers. No, the second blade snapped. Pepper couldn't bear the idea that Aaron might screw up and she began to cry. She was wearing her down jacket. Not because she was cold, but because it made her feel more comfortable, more protected. And now the nylon sleeve made a gentle but insistent swishing sound as her arms shook beside her body. Pepper, said Aaron firmly. I need you to hold the light steady. Can you do that? Pepper was close to a meltdown, but somehow she drew strength from Aaron and began to relax a little. The beam from the flashlight fell steady 
on the ignition once more. The drive had passed for Morgan. It hadn't passed quickly. It hadn't passed slowly. It had just passed. All he could think about was the pain he was in. He'd never seen so much blood in his life, especially his own, and his mouth. He didn't know where they were or where they were going, but he knew he'd be spending the evening behind bars. Maybe things would go better in the morning. The sheriff couldn't just keep him locked up in a tiny small town cell. Morgan never found out what Aaron saw up at the Hewitt house. She'd just come back in a panic and tried to start the van. That's when Sheriff Hoyt had shown up again, and from that moment on their night had eroded into mentally unstable violent horror. But whatever it was Aaron had seen, there was no way it could compete with what that bastard had just done to him. Up front, the sheriff was talking on his car radio. I don't care if you're tired, he said. Get your butt in gear and get over to the Crawford Mill. Those two fillies are good to go. What did he just say? Morgan shook his head, tried to clear the thoughts. Who the hell was the sheriff talking to? What did he say? Two fillies? And what did Hoyt mean by good to go? What the fuck was going on? Feeling the tension rise within him, Morgan pressed his face against one of the windows and peered out into the darkness. Where were they? They didn't seem to be on any major road, there was no street lighting of any kind, and they couldn't be anywhere near town. The headlights of the car swept forwards, scything through the black, until at last the vehicle came over the brow of a low hill and turned left onto a dirt track. At the end of the track stood a solitary building, an imposing two-storied farmhouse, constructed in the plantation style, but the design of the place was almost... If only Morgan could see into Aaron's mind, her memories, he would have known that he was being driven up to the Hewitt place, where Sheriff Hoyt, Old Monty, and his boy Leatherface were going to have a well of a time. Now it was the can opener's turn. Aaron had already broken the two blades, filled with the scissors, and found the corkscrew totally fucking useless, which left the can opener. Pepper was good with the flashlight now, and finally Aaron could see the ignition switch coming loose. Yes, it was definitely coming. The casing was moving, bit by bit, out of the plastic surround. If she could just lever... Aaron concentrated, careful not to push too hard for fear of breaking her last usable tool. But the more the ignition moved, the faster she worked at it, until at last it broke free of the steering column. Finally! Aaron sighed, relieved at the sight of the exposed ignition wires. Then she pushed the can opener back into place and pulled out the tweezers thinking that everything anyone had ever said about the trusty Swiss army knife was an understatement. This little baby was going to save their lives. Something walked in the darkness towards the van. Where'd you learn how to do that? Asked Pepper, impressed. In juvie, they called my youth misspent. Pepper looked dumbfounded. You were in juvenile hall? Aaron pulled out five wires that had been connected to the ignition block and began to strip the ends of them with her teeth. Yep. The other girl watched her with something close to amazement. Aaron was the last person she would have guessed was a juvenile delinquent. Pepper thought Aaron really did have a problem when it came to dope and drugs. She thought Aaron was straight. 
but if she had been that straight, she wouldn't have gone down to Mexico alone with three guys. So if Aaron wasn't totally square, what? The baby. Aaron was pregnant. Maybe it had changed her in some way. It was the wrong time to be analyzing stuff, but Pepper's beleaguered mind enjoyed the break, taking five from it all. She wished these guys had never picked her up. Perhaps that was unfair, but she'd come along with them, and some sick twist of fate had taken a sledgehammer to her life. After today, none of them would be the same again. Aaron was oblivious to all the sweet girl's internal thoughts. She had to concentrate on the wires, touching the bare cable ends together, trying one pair, then another, then the engine roared to life. cheered Aaron, and she quickly twisted the two good wires together. Pepper squealed with victory as Aaron turned on the headlamps and put the van into gear. And this time, the useless piece of shit didn't stall. They were out of here. The lights were on behind nearly every window of the house, and there were other lights around the back of the building. Morgan couldn't see the outdoor lights, but he noticed how they threw a white glaze upon the rear of the house, casting the brute rectangular block of stone into stark relief. Hoyt pulled up on a grit patch in front of the main entrance. At no point during their drive did he use the cherry on his roof, nor did he use the siren. But then he wasn't in any hurry. He'd already made his arrest. The sheriff applied the handbrake, then climbed up out of the car. He left the headlights on, and Morgan could see the beams crash up against the pale brick of the farmhouse. This was no police station. Morgan coughed and spat more blood onto the floor of the vehicle. He picked up countless scratches and cuts from the broken glass of the bourbon bottle, and the handcuffs were so tight that they rubbed the skin off his wrist but mostly the boy was now in shock. Hoyt opened the rear door. He was holding a flashlight. Get out. A flat command. No communication, no empathy, no threat, just an order. Morgan's first reaction was to stay put. He'd already been beaten by the sheriff, so what was the bastard going to do out at this place? Maybe if there was someone inside the farmhouse, Morgan could ask them for help. They might even have a phone, if he could just persuade Hoyt or anyone to let him phone his parents. Best play ball. Morgan got out of the car, clumsily with his hands in front of him. And as he stood up, the sheriff took a good long look at him, at his swollen, bruised, cut mouth. There was blood all over the kid's shirt. New York, my friggin' ass. (laughs) Morgan said, or at least that's what Hoyt thought he'd said, because the boy was struggling to get a single shit-ass word out. Shut up, faggot! The sheriff had more important things to do than play twenty questions, trying to understand some fuckwipe with a busted trap. He snapped on the flashlight and stabbed the powerful white beam into the boy's eyes. Morgan had only just gotten used to the dark. He raised his hands and squinted, his eyes watering so he had no way of seeing the vicious shove of Hoyt's right hand as it bolted forward and pushed Morgan over onto the ground. The boy landed face first in the dust, but quickly rolled over onto his back. It was just like the mill all fucking over again, lying on the ground with that bastard walking around like he was some kind of god. Hoyt just looked down at the boy. You and your friend should have left that girl alone, he spat. Then he raised his hoof his boot over Morgan's head. Morgan's eyes opened wide. No, no! Hoyt brought the boot down hard, stamping the screaming little shit into oblivion. Pepper wrapped her arms around Aaron and briefly hugged her from behind as the vehicle started to roll. 
Erin took care not to over-accelerate. She didn't want to risk slamming the wheels into a ditch or pitching the whole van forward into a tree. She slowly turned the van round to face the narrow road they'd come in on. Then she put the beams on full, hit the gas, and began to drive, and Erin lurched, her whole body thrown forward in the seat. Behind her, Pepper fell, landing awkwardly on Morgan's beanbag. They didn't understand. The van wasn't moving, and it felt as if the front end had dropped. The front of the van had dropped. Erin shook her head. What the hell? Then she separated the ignition wires, cutting the engine, and grabbed Pepper's flashlight. She had to go see what the hell had happened. Pepper got to her feet and looked out through the side windows as Erin got out and took a look around the van. She didn't have to look for very long. When she reached the front passenger side, she found that the whole front wheel had fallen off. But how? It was impossible. Come on! She called, asking Pepper to join her. They had to get the wheel back in place as quickly as possible, and it wasn't going to be easy. The tire was a massive racing slick, and it would take the two of them to jack the van and then lift the wheel back into place. Yet another delay they could really do without. If Sheriff Hoyt came back, as he said he would, before they finished, they'd be well and truly burned, boned, fucked. Pepper got out through the side door and, whoa, 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 rewind the tape a little. The whole front wheel had fallen off. How? Aaron shone her torch at the gleaming chrome rim lying on the ground. There was something about it. Something. Somebody stole the goddamn lug nuts. The van had been tampered with so that once the wheel started to roll, it came free and fell off. Who the hell? She quickly checked the three remaining wheels and found that the nuts had been removed from all of them. They had to be around somewhere. Not exactly thinking straight, Aaron pointed the flashlight down by the fallen wheel, then under the van and around the other side, but she couldn't find any of the missing lug nuts. What are we going to do? Shuddered Pepper. She couldn't believe they were still there. Just when she thought they were finally going to get away, another problem. It was her school dream all over again, except this time she wasn't just frustrated, she was scared out of her goddamn mind. She was sure the fear was making her crazy. Just then, Erin saw something glinting in the torchlight. She stepped over, praying it would be the... It was empty. It was an empty bottle of bourbon. The bottle couldn't have been there long because the remaining traces of liquor were still wet and the bottle was clean. Somebody must have dropped it there recently. Maybe the person who'd messed with the van. Damn! The search was getting Erin nowhere. Pepper tried to help, but the lug nuts had just vanished. After a few more fruitless minutes, Erin decided to unscrew the spare down from the outside of the rear door of the van. She didn't want the spare itself, but the five lug nuts holding it in place. That way, she could put one nut on each of the wheels. It wouldn't be perfect, and it wouldn't last forever, but it should do for getting out of town. They'd also need the jack to put the fallen wheel back in position. The toll was stored somewhere in the back of the van, and Aaron planned to fetch it once she'd removed all the lug nuts from the spare. Pepper looked on as Aaron walked over to the rear door, took one look at the nuts, and cursed. Shit. She rubbed a hand through her hair. Shit. Andy took the tire iron. She remembered he'd taken it with him up to the Hewitt house and never returned. Was there one, just one, thing about this fucking day that didn't completely suck. They were wasting time. Sure, things were quiet enough now, but Erin didn't know how long it would last. She couldn't believe that old Monty or the freak with the chainsaw hadn't come after her yet. Maybe it was because the sheriff had been here. But Erin knew they really needed to get away from this place. Something was coming. She could feel it. And did the dark mill have to look so damn frightening? Every time she looked up at the place, it made her feel nauseous. All those revolting skulls in the moonlight. There was someone in the woods watching. Erin could feel it moving, or at least she thought she could. She'd been struggling to turn the lug nut with her bare fingers for so long, she couldn't tell whether the movement was in the metal or in the skin of her bleeding, blistered hands. So far, she'd failed to remove a single nut. Pepper had tried to help, but... Pepper only got in the way. 
there just wasn't enough room for the two of them to work at the spare simultaneously, which is why Aaron had suggested shifts, though, in reality, she had no intention of giving the other girl a shot. Pepper didn't look like she had what it took, while Aaron, on the other hand, had been forced to share Kemper with the shop all through their relationship, and you can't do that without learning a few things. Suddenly, Aaron stopped. She'd heard something. She was sure of it somewhere in the trees behind her. Something was coming. Christ, she was positive. But the wheel, the van was on three wheels. She looked over at Pepper. Get the van. The quiet urgency in Aaron's voice was unmistakable, but the van was on three wheels. Pepper frowned. But do it, shouted Aaron, and almost immediately the two of them were back inside. Aaron behind the wheel and Pepper on the back seat, the blood stained soon forgotten in the face of her renewed terror. Aaron quickly blew on her fingers to help dry the sweat and blood, and then she took hold of the ignition wires and crossed the ones that would start the engine. The van rumbled and began to move forward lumbering, unbalanced, wounded, but still moving forward. Aaron remembered reading somewhere that the average walking pace for a man was just over two miles per hour, while a fast walking pace was maybe four or five. But if someone was running, he could probably manage a speed of, screw it, she floored the gas pedal and hoped for the best. If another wheel came off, it came off, but right now she didn't feel like she had any choice. And from the darkness behind them came the unrelenting scream of the chainsaw. It was sudden, erupting with a jagged splutter from the cover of the trees. No, not again. Aaron checked the rear view, but it was dark outside, and she couldn't be sure over the sound of the turbocharger whether she really was hearing that god-awful sound or just imagining it. Maybe the axle was grinding or something, but Pepper could hear it as well, and she couldn't believe it. She'd never doubted what Aaron had said about the farmhouse, but somehow hadn't been able to accept it. A chainsaw-wielding guy sporting dead people's faces? It just wasn't possible. Even now, Pepper was not convinced about the ripped-off faces, but she was absolutely goddamn certain there was someone out there with the chainsaw. Don't stop! She cried. I'm not! shouted Aaron in reply, and she pushed the disabled van almost to its limit within the confines of the dirt trail. They only had a few more yards to go, and they'd be back on the access road where she could probably pick up more speed. Pitching and swaying like a boy with one leg missing, the van heaved forward, jolting lopsidedly between the decaying trees of the surrounding grove. The headlights were working fine. But the way ahead was a confusion of dead wood and straggling undergrowth. One wrong turn and they'd be in trouble. Suddenly the van dipped sharply and, for one terrible moment, Aaron thought another wheel had come off. She put one hand on the dash to keep from falling out of her seat and used her other hand to wrestle with the steering wheel. She could hear the chainsaw now, which meant that her worst fear had just come true. The maniac was here and he was coming after them. When she'd faced him up at the house, he'd seemed unstoppable. He'd crushed Andy like a bug. He was totally insane in the skin. Aaron had to choke back an almost overwhelming wave of repulsion, caused by him, her memory of the sick mask with its crude stitching and torn eye holes. The kind of evil represented by that flesh-wearing bastard was entirely beyond Aaron's comprehension. No amount of words, abuse, or psychological jargon could ever hope to explain the ugly existence of that squealing, fat pervert in his dead skin mask. His very heartbeat was an insult to humanity. The chainsaw rushed forward, grinding, turning, retching, carried by strong hands, and a deviant strapped on face. Inside the mask, his eyes were rolling like the cutting chain, rolling inside the mask, rolling to bring them death. The van lurched and shook. They could both hear the chainsaw growing nearer, and Pepper was close to screaming point. But Aaron remained focused. She was trying to keep the vehicle straight when a second tire came loose and rolled out from underneath the left rear wheel arc. Almost immediately, the van went down and dug its nose hard into the earth. Pepper fell to the floor, but Aaron managed to hold on to her seat, ready for the impact. The remaining wheels continued to turn, but the Dodge was going nowhere. 
Erin clutched at the steering, holding it more and more tightly as if she could move the vehicle by willpower alone. She was tense, disheveled. Her great escape plan had been shot to fuck. Now she was just another victim. She leaned forward in her seat, her face almost up against the windscreen, urging the van forward. Fuck it! The turbocharged engine roared as she stepped on the gas, feeding more and more power into the transmission, only to grind the axles into the dirt. Yet still she persevered. They could still get away, if just she tried hard enough. The chainsaw came screaming through the window, sharp metal teeth catching the cracked edges of the bloodstained suicide hole and hurling toward the red crystal shards in all directions. Hacking in and out of the van, sprang broken glass, screaming and spinning and filling the rotting wagon with exhausted poison. The violence ripped through the closed door, raggedly squealing for disembodied limbs. Pepper screamed and Aaron pushed harder on the gas, the laboring engine and the rampant chainsaw locked in a death duel of decibels. Stressed beyond limits, the back window finally exploded, leaving the chainsaw free to gouge through the metal of the rear door. Dust clouds mingled with exhaust fumes, bright golden sparks erupted from the epicenter of the saw, and finally Pepper was able to look back and catch her first devastating sight of Leatherface, his facial skin and casement aglow with hot saw fever. What do we do? She screamed. The van was going nowhere and Pepper was really losing it. Aaron had to do something, but what? That bastard had them cornered. He was right outside the vehicle. If they went out, he'd catch them. But if they stayed in there... Aaron couldn't think straight. It was all happening too fast, and the noise of that chainsaw was chewing up her concentration just as easily as it was now ripping random lines through the rear of the van. Kemper's van. The roar of the maniac power tool was bearing down upon them with the blind fury of a crippling cerebral hemorrhage. Their bodies would be shaken to bloody pieces in a red hurricane of epileptic dissection. Aaron climbed into the back and grabbed hold of Pepper. They huddled in the center of the van, not knowing what to do or what would happen next. Suddenly, the chainsaw moved away from the rear door and circled the van as if it was weighing up another assault. They could hear it, their eyes darting in all directions, wondering where. Silence. Then the ripping explosion of glass and gasoline fumes returned as the chainsaw came crashing through the driver's side window and tore into the upholstery of the seat Aaron had been sitting in moments before. The high-pitched cutting chain slashed the seat cover apart, churned up the foam cushioning, and then withdrew, only to come screeching into the metal of the door itself. Aaron and Pepper could only cringe in terror as the chainsaw came at the driver's door again and again and again, gnawing the primer gray panel into twisted metal trash beneath a torrent of sparks. Most men would have been injured by kickback as soon as the tip of the saw bit the solid wall of, of the van, but the maniac had had plenty of experience of cutting up the wrong things. He lived for the fill of metal grinding against metal, of metal cutting flesh, of metal touching skin. He lived for it. He fucking lived for it. Glass and slivers of metal shrapnel spat through the air back into the van, hitting the two girls. They screamed in fear, the whites of their eyes reflecting the erratic diffusion of sparks. Uh, er, Aaron? Suddenly, the saw was gone again, leaving only the odor of burning metal and a whole pile of broken van on the driver's seat. He was outside walking. They could hear the saw on low rev, clutch still engaged. Once, twice, the chainsaw motor turned, like the barking of a prairie dog circling its carry-on prey. The two frightened victims scurried away from the center of the van and pressed their backs against the side furthest away from the sound. The chainsaw broke through the wall behind them. Aaron dived forward, sparks stinging her skin. She heard Pepper cry out in terror, and the two of them almost collided as they landed in a heap on the other side of the van, as far away from the furious rendering machine as possible. Aaron hated this. They were surviving on fear alone. They weren't doing anything. They weren't fighting back. They were just cooped up in this while the power-tripping bastard took his time slicing up the van. 
Why didn't he just come on in and get it over with? Smoke billowed into the wagon as the chainsaw continued to split the side wide open, gouging a deep, jagged canal of ripped metal almost from floor to roof. The fumes burned Pepper's eyes, causing them to flood with even more tears. She couldn't believe what was happening to her. Where the hell was the sheriff? Aaron looked across and saw something gleaming through one of the fresh holes in the other side of the van. It was an eye. Rampant, leering, crazed, turning, staring, salivating through the mask. And then it was gone. But Aaron knew that eye only too well. She remembered the same lunatic stare from when she first saw it come charging through that sliding door up at the Hewitt place. It was unforgettable. His eye had the frenzied look of a pig being raked by a disemboweling machine. She pressed her back up against the closed side door, clinging onto Pepper, and being hugged in return in a fearful embrace that was fully expectant of death. The chainsaw had burst through the side door behind them and had caught the shoulder of the girl's down jacket, casting a plume of tiny feathers up against her cheek, but no blood. Aaron fell forward and turned to see the cutting chain laying waste to the door. The bastard was playing with them, first the rear, then the driver's seat, both sides of the van, hunting them through the solid walls, destroying their cover, making a mockery of their hiding place. But that last attack had been too close for Pepper. She couldn't believe she wasn't injured. The saw had been turning less than a quarter of an inch away from her skin. If it had touched her, her flesh would have been thrown up into the air just like the bits and pieces of the van. And it wouldn't have been sparks shooting out from the cut. It would have been her flesh and blood. She'd had enough. Taking hold of what tiny amount of courage she had left, Pepper scrambled over to the front of the van and got out through the mangled door on the driver's side. She was going to make a break for it. Pepper! Aaron cried. The girl was crazy. She'd never get away. She'd be throwing her life away just like the teenage girl with the revolver. They had to stick together. It was their only... Pepper jumped out of the van and ran for her life. She hadn't spoken another word to Aaron. She'd just taken off. Aaron crawled forward, rested her shoulder against the back of the broken driver's seat, and looked out through the windshield. The headlights were still on, and where was Pepper? Aaron looked, but she couldn't see the girl, but she could see the murderer. No. Aaron saw him run over to stand just in front of the vehicle, his leather apron folding and creasing as he shuffled along, his scalp of stolen hair flopping erratically in the breeze. His great expanse of tailored flesh quivered beneath his clothes as he held the roaring chainsaw above his head. Hallelujah. He looked down into a patch of darkness below the beams and suddenly Aaron felt the cold hand of fear squeezing her heart. No, Aaron understood. Pepper had tripped or fallen down in front of the van, dropping below the headlights, where now, standing in the full glory of the makeshift floodlights, the killer notched up the revs and leant down with the chainsaw. <laughs> pushing it into the fallen girl's face. In, in, he hacked into her face, the cold cutting blades mincing her vocal cords and whipping out her windpipe. Pepper had finally woken up from her dream. Aaron clutched her head and wept. No! Outside, the insane bastard stomped like a retard in a geyser of blood and down feathers. He was swaying, shitting on the bitch's innards with his saw, howling as her life sprayed out across the Texan dirt. But all the while, his face turned towards the van. While he ground and pumped and hacked and snorted, his insane screaming eyes were constantly fixed on Aaron almost as if he was putting on a show for her to let her know she was next. But Aaron had gone beyond fear. While her new friend, the young smiling hitchhiker they picked up on the Mexican border, was being reduced to a flat slurry of intestines, Aaron suddenly felt cold and limp. She just watched him. He stood there thrusting the chainsaw and screeching insanely over the sound of gasoline fury. But Aaron was numb. She tenderly reached out a hand towards the perverse figure. Her mind dealt the final blow. The saw-fucking-freak was wearing Kemper's 
Thanks. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 11 of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization by Stephen Hand. Okay, that's a wrap on two characters tonight. First off, that's a wrap on Morgan. Thank you, Sean Campbell, uh, for being a good friend, for doing a great job as Morgan, co-hosting the Out of Print Slashers podcast and After the Slash After Show, and for being a great friend and loyal subscriber. And that's also a wrap for Cat Loveless, everybody, doing the voice of Pepper. Great job, Cat. Thank you so much for uh, trying out uh, doing a voice here on the channel for the first time. If you want to do it again, just let me know. You're always welcome. And anybody else that wants to voice a character in any book I do here on the channel, you can sign up on the Patreon, and uh, the $10 tier and higher uh, will let you voice a character in every audio book I do. Um, sorry about the delay on this one. I've been moving into a new house. And it has taken a while. That's why it's been such a long gap between the last narration and this one. But I gotta say, I really enjoyed this chapter. We got a lot of great stuff with Hoyt and Morgan. Uh, you know, Hoyt just busting out those teeth of, of Morgan's with that fucking bourbon bottle. <clears throat> the whole thing with uh, Pepper and Aaron, uh, you know, um, in the van and the wheels falling off. And of course, Leatherface taking out Pepper. Oh my god, that's fucking brutal. Um, you know, Andy trying to escape, that was a brutal scene too, uh, snapping his own spine trying to escape. I mean, just picture yourself up on that hook for a second, trying to save your life. I mean, Jesus. Um, makes me think of Dead by Daylight, uh, the people who get hooked like two or three times per match. That shit would get old pretty fast, you know, getting hooked in the same spot. Um, but yeah, let me know what you guys thought of this chapter, if you enjoyed the deaths, uh, what you thought of how the book handled the whole thing with Pepper, uh, everything with Andy, and of course with Hoyt and Morgan. And I'll be back very soon with more of this book. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. And I really mean soon, not 10 or 11 days from now. I'll be back soon. See you soon. <laughs>